Carlos, Michael, welcome. Michelle, welcome. Thanks, Alfredo. Hello, thank you. Hola. Hi. Hi. <laughs> Está la profesora Carla Vázquez, quien va a estar moderando este webinar. Profesora Carla. That great, no. no. Carla was mentioning that this webinar is going to be about filmmaking, cinema, and COVID 19. Okay, she says, welcome to both of you, and Thank well, you. let's start over. Let's start with both of you. Thank you for having me. Yeah, thank you. Um, can everybody hear me now? Yes, yes, that's, that's better. better. Okay. Um, well, um, the, the audience is waiting for you. So tell us about, we're going to have a small conversation with your thoughts and your views on how it's going to go forward, the cinema industry nowadays after everything that has happened. Um, Michelle, do you want to start since you're coming more from the production side? Oh, thank side you, I'm, Michael. Well, no, so just because I'm post-production more so, so yeah, <laughs> just logically well, At follows. least that way I'll stay away so late for me. <laughs> yeah, sure, I will. Well, Michelle, yes, uh, what hi. do you think is going to be like moving forward with everything that has happened in the movie, uh, in the cinema industry? Yeah, I think it's a really exciting time. Actually, I think it's a time to really innovate and be very creative. Um, it's great that Ines is here because she's going to translate. And, and I, I'll talk about a couple of things. I'll talk about my experience of filming during COVID. And I'll talk about the situation post-COVID and the kind oh, yeah, of changes that we need me. to make. You've okay. been working through, all, through the pandemic. Through the exactly. Pandemic. Oh, my God. Yeah. So how, how, how that has been? Well, because we did a stay at home episode of a science fiction show I'm working on called Space Command. So wow. instead of filming it in the studio, we all the actors, and I'm an actor sometimes, uh, all filmed themselves at home and then posted their video for the post-production team to put together with the color correction and the sound mixing and all those other great things and broadcast the video on YouTube on a live convention a couple of weeks ago. So that's something I've never done before. Ines, um, are you gonna translate for? Yeah, no, I was waiting to see when, when should I start. <laughs> bueno, eh, Michelle menciona que el COVID ha sido bastante interesante, ha sido un proceso que uno se tiene que acoplar ya. Eh, en el caso de Space Command que hicieron un, en el cual yo también trabajé, en el, eh, que hicieron un episodio llamado Ripple Effect, grabaron todo cada uno de este, sus casas, se editó todo cada uno de este, sus casas, todos los efectos visuales se hicieron desde su casa, cada quien, el productor principal y los coproductores liderando, así como lo estamos haciendo por Zoom, Fue un proyecto muy interesante, el cual ojalá todo el mundo tenga la oportunidad de ver. Well, that sounds actually great. I'd um, love to be able to show a, a little clip of it, but I, I'm not sure we have that capability. Perhaps we can share that at some other point with the um, audience. Could we, Ines, show sí, the clip? Sí, tenemos eh, nuestro host, si es posible de que comparta el pequeño clip que compartió Michelle da Costa para eh, enseñarle a todos nuestros seguidores. Sí. 
space command is all right. Is there any sound? Okay, so we're watching the credit. Section. Okay, well, that's right. Yeah, we can watch it in the background. It, it's fun. Because there's no, there's no sound at the moment. Maybe we can watch it in the background and I can speak over it. Um, you can. Because it, I think it's so quiet and it's in English, so. Sí, Michelle quiere ir hablando mientras, mientras se, se va mostrando el clip. Get the idea. <laughs> Solo para tener una idea de cómo va. Carla, would you like to ask some questions about the show and how we did that? Um, so is you, well, as I think I can kind of see, is a science fiction show, right? That's right. And these are all, uh, you know, very famous science fiction stars from different shows like uh, different Star Treks, Babylon 5, This is Mir Furlon, uh, Robert Picardo, an actor from Orange is the New Black. And so it's, uh, it's like an incredible cast it's like a family really and so the opportunity for the actors to keep acting during the pandemic of you know the height of the lockdown I think was was really you know so unusual and also so empowering and really to look at different ways in which we can work because the lockdown doesn't just end and we don't even know whether there'll be another phase so I think this is probably an example of a new way of working that we're going to have to adapt to. And this is an example of how we did it. Sí. And so, uh, Space Command is a series of science fiction. Como se puede ver, se tiene muchos actores de ciencia ficción bien reconocidos, como Robert Picardo, que estaba en Orange is the New Black. Eh, Bono Dara, que lo hace Mir Furland, también es de ciencia ficción de series y, y películas de ciencia ficción. Y bueno, el, el, esta pandemia y todo el confinamiento ha hecho que básicamente tener la oportunidad de crear algo en virtual que para los actores es una muy buena oportunidad y bueno, es que uno no sabe cuándo que va a terminar la pandemia y por lo menos uno va avanzando. Um, and which, uh, which part you think was the most challenging about working now? Um, Mm -hmm. in this kind of show. So, I, think the, I think the key challenges now are about going to the, how do you work on set? You know, for example, and I shared some information with Ines that I would love you to distribute to, again, to the audience is, uh, for example, now you have a COVID compliance officer. So that's like a new screen credit and you know, there's a lot of different stipulations. For example, you have to have your temperature taken. As soon as you go on set, you have to wear a mask once your temperature is taken, then you wear a wristband, you know, and all these other, you know, other elements that come into it. You know, sí. it's just, it's really just so challenging, but you know, can it actually make us raise our game? That's what's really interesting about it. Sí, realmente el COVID lo ha cambiado mucho. Se vuelve de una manera estresante, ya que uno se tiene que ir adaptando. Uno que viene de set, ahora hacerlo con la pandemia, ya se ha creado una, un especialista que va a venir en los créditos como supervisor de COVID, vamos a decir en español. La temperatura se va a medir, de que ver si hay personas que están tosiendo, que tienen síntomas. Realmente es algo desafiante para el set, porque imagínate con tanta gente en el medio, pero eh, es algo que se tiene que hacer. Um, yeah, actually I've seen that in, in some countries, they've been like going back to sets, but after a while they have to stop. Right. So it's really interesting the fact that we are evolving so fast that we now have a person that might take care of that type of situation. Absolutely. People are already training. It's a certification that anyone can train for. So actually what I said about, you know, opportunity, 
there's always opportunity out of adversity. And one of the things you could do to actually make yourself indispensable in the film industry is to train in the Dominican Republic as a certified COVID compliance officer. Mm -hmm. Sí, ahora mismo ya también se ha creado la certificación para que personas estén entrenadas para identificar qué personas tienen o no el virus durante el eh, rodaje. Por ejemplo, se ha creado un entrenamiento virtual que está disponible, que por ejemplo, expertos en República Dominicana se quieran identificar en esa parte en producción y que sean unas personas especialistas en en revisar qué personas tienen o no el COVID durante un set. Ok. Um, well, to me it's like, well, I think it's something amazing <laughs> that we as humans are so capable of adapting so fast. <laughs> we are all yeah. working and making it happen however we see fit. Yeah. Um, but let's not forget about Michael too. No, come on, Michael. <laughs> no, uh, yeah. I thought I'd go second since I'm going to talk more about post production. So, um, yeah. So for me, it's um, well, it's interesting because post production, we're so used to kind of being on our own anyway. So the transition to COVID was not really a transition. I would say um, the thing that was actually good for post production is that it's kind of sped up this, um, this um, I guess, directors and other creatives that are in other parts of the world feeling more comfortable um, with working remotely because you have to work remotely now, um, which is amazing because, you know, it's like, it's gonna create more opportunities for people to work in different, like from, from uh, Dominican Republic, for example, you could potentially like edit for a film that's somewhere else and people will be more comfortable with that. Um, And Anna, if you want me to stop if, to translate at any point, just let me know to like stop and then you can take sure. over. Ok, eh, hasta ahora Michael, que es experto en postproducción, ha hablado de básicamente cómo la pandemia ha permitido que un proceso que ya existía, que era el proceso de trabajar remoto desde distintas partes del mundo, eh, se acelerara un poquito más. Entonces... Eh, Realmente no ha sido un cambio tan significativo para el para lo que es el espacio de postproducción. Right. And, and so, and, oh, go ahead. No, I was not going to ask you about the challenges because uh, even though uh, most of your work might be remote, you might have some challenges now too. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think. Cha I mean, the challenge always is getting footage, right? Like you have to get you know, the, the stuff to work on. Um, and so there are some people like bigger studios, um, different organizations are using something like Sony C, which is a Sony CI. Um, and that allows editors from anywhere in the world to download dailies, um, work with people that are anywhere in the world, uh, like in real time, so they can actually give notes in real time. Um, it's just like they're in the room together. Um, and then for smaller projects, you're using stuff like Frame.io, Um, or Vimeo, if you have a pro account, you can give frame specific notes. It's not real time, um, but it's like, it's really helpful. Um, but challenge wise, I mean, it's post is weird. Like I said, because post it's, it's really easy for post to adapt because we are so used to being on our own. Um, and so, and there's, it takes longer for us to kind of feel the effects of stuff shutting down because there's so much stuff that's already been shot. So I'm still editing remotely um, with the director. He's in California. Um, I, we use the whole workflow that, that I've told you guys about. Um, we're using Vimeo, but I, um, it's the same as Frame.io when you have the pro account. Um, but yeah, it'll take, it'll take a little bit longer. And um, like Michelle said, like people, the production people are adapting really quickly. So for post, I'm hoping that, you know, we're not going to see a slowdown necessarily um, because there'll, there'll be more footage coming in. Ok, eh, hasta ahora, el, eh, Michael habla de que por suerte la, la parte de postproducción de los proyectos tiende a ser bastante flexible y que han podido eh, adaptarse a los cambios que han generado la situación del COVID eh, bastante rápidamente. Eh, que, hay, que uno de los problemas o, los, eh, o las situaciones más complicadas o más complejas ahora mismo es poder manejar el material, o sea, el, la 
¿verdad? el footage, grabar y manejar el material necesario, pero que diferentes eh, estudios o diferentes proyectos están usando eh, herramientas online. Por ejemplo, él mencionó Frame.io o Vimeo, que lo están usando productoras un poco más pequeñas, y entonces también está eh, Sony CI, o sea, CI, que es, un es una herramienta de, de postproducción que se está utilizando bastante ahora mismo. Okay. Well, have, what, uh, what did you say, Michael? Oh no, I was, yeah, I just fell Anna. I think I think she covered covered it all. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, well, we have a question uh, here uh, from one of our our students, um, Alexia. Uh, Alexia tiene una pregunta. Well, I'm gonna be translating myself because somebody just told me that I'm only talking to you mm -hmm. and not the audience, and I didn't notice. <laughs> Eh, yo voy a estar trans, traduciendo lo mismo que le diga a ellos en caso de que alguien no me entienda. Me disculpo que no me había dado cuenta que lo estaba haciendo. Eh, Alexia Felipe pregunta cómo la pandemia ha incrementado el uso de, eh, de CGI y pantallas verdes para poder seguir produciendo contenido de una manera segura. Um, the question is, how is the pandemic has increased the use of CGI and the green screens uh, to keep productions moving along? And being safe. Um, I mean, I've read about this, um, so I do know that, for example, they are uh, adapting in that way. Um, so it's going to be more like kind of video game. You know, they'll create the worlds um, in CGI, and then they can put the actors into those. Um, and I think that's just going to be kind of the way of the future anyway. So COVID is kind of speeding that up. Uh, because you have so much control over everything. Um, one example I read about, right, is if you want to shoot some scene that happens at sunset, you know, like if you actually do that in every day at sunset, you know, you might not get it done. You got to come back the next day. Um, if you do it in CGI, you have like all the control over that. So you could easily manipulate whatever you need to. Um, so I think that is something that's actually they're working on. I don't know. I, I believe it'll take a little while to like get it all in place, but but I think that's coming. Um, okay. about you, Michelle? Yeah, so. I mean, it's it's a very pertinent question because that's one of the things that we did to make the Space Command Ripple Effect episode is that the head of production, David Bartlett, was actually driving around LA with a green screen in his car to drop off to the actors <laughs> and giving them directions on, you know, how to put up the green screen. And, and then the cinematographer was calling on the cell phone to, you know, adjust the lighting in their homes. And it's remarkable, you know, <laughs> I think it's almost like we're going to become obsolete and then actually the production will go on without us. And then they'll be just CGIing in Michael and myself and a nurse. <laughs> and <Tom> and <laughs> That'll be it. You know, am I even here? That's the question. <laughs> Sí, Michelle comenta cómo así básicamente se hizo el episodio de Ripple Effect y cómo nuestro coproductor David Bartlett tuvo que manejar alrededor de Los Ángeles con una pantalla verde indicándole a cada actor cómo hacer las tomas, cómo poner la pantalla. El cinematógrafo Masi, un italiano que vive en Los Ángeles también, tuvo que indicar cuál era la mejor luz, cuál era la mejor forma y bromea como al final nosotros nos vamos a volver obsoletos de que ya al final a nosotros mismos nos va a hacer CGI a todos los que estamos aquí presentes. Eh, bueno, Michael lo que comentaba era que él ha escuchado de que esto se está trabajando, de que la gente está utilizando CGI y pantallas verdes para, para facilitar eh, lo que es eh, verdad la grabación, las grabaciones, pero que él entiende que que todavía falta un poco para que eso se determine de desarrollar como al 100%, pero que sí él ha visto que lo que se, cre lo que se hace es que se crean los escenarios o los mundos eh, y entonces se, se incluye luego eh, dentro del proceso de postproducción a los actores como dentro de estos espacios. Um, well, guys, the questions are actually flowing through the chat. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> De hecho, tenemos muchas preguntas en el chat y vamos a irlas leyendo una a una para poder darles respuesta a todos. Um, 
Jose Patin, he asked how uh, personally, what uh, during this pandemic, what has been your biggest challenge? O sea, oh. Jose pregunta cuál ha sido el, el reto más grande personalmente para ellos durante la pandemia. Do you want to go first, Michael? That's, uh, yeah, that's fine. Uh, I, I'm giving you the floor, you know. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, my biggest, I mean, the biggest challenge, obviously, I, I think, is like you just can't go places. Um, so work-wise, the challenges are minimal because of what I said. Like, I'm used to being, you know, in my edit suite by myself, um, but you can't go. Like, I wish I could be in Santo Domingo right now with you guys for the festival. Uh, you know, like, that's, that's the hard part. Like, you can't go places. Um, things have slowed down a lot. Um, so it does complicate a lot of things. Um, so I think that's like the hardest thing for me. Eh, Michael habla de que para él lo más difícil ha sido eh, no poder salir, estar encerrados, eh, pero que a nivel de lo que es la postproducción es, no, no ha sido un cambio muy, muy radical para él porque él trabaja desde su, su suite de postproducción normalmente. O sea que igual esa parte no ha cambiado mucho. Michelle. Oh, gosh, where do I start? Ines, this is a joint uh, answer. Oh, uh, right? <laughs> it, it should be. I think, I think I'll do the introduction so you can translate this bit. But Ines and I were in a unique situation of being stuck outside of our home country. So I was trapped in Portugal and Ines was trapped in Los Angeles. And I went to Portugal to help an elderly family friend and then couldn't get back to the UK. And I had actually never been to Portugal before. So I didn't see any, any people, anything. Everything was completely locked down. Some of it was under martial law. So I would just look out of the window. The streets are completely empty. And then inside of that, I start to make this sci-fi show. And so it was the most surreal experience of my life. I, I, you know, I don't know, I guess that's a personal challenge. You know, and in, a, in amongst all of this, I have to carry on with my remote working in Los Angeles, where I have my lovely producers saying, oh, can you get like this A-list star on the phone because we want him to star in our movie? I'm like, um, maybe not. But, you know, that's not the answer in Los Angeles. You're like, yeah, sure. Sure. <laughs> Sí, Michelle promea como las dos al mismo tiempo que estuvimos muy comunicadas durante el principio del COVID. Estábamos en una situación muy similar, ella atrapada en Portugal, yo atrapada en Los Ángeles, incapaces de volver a nuestros países. Y en el caso de ella, ella estuvo atrapada en Portugal donde había martial law, que es como que los militares toman la calle y se apoderan de todo el control eh, policial y político y todo lo demás. Y cómo desde allí tenía que hacer todo el trabajo de Los Ángeles, que a veces los productores le llamaban, eh, puedes conseguir a tal actor de tipo, de categoría A, que es una categoría bien alta en Los Ángeles. Y ella estaba como que sí, claro, como que es posible. A lo, en Los Ángeles tú no puedes decir que no a nada, por lo que es bastante difícil trabajar. Es una experiencia muy personal, muy retante para ella, que todavía está en progreso. Me imagino que la diferencia de horario tampoco ayudó mucho. Oh, uh, the time difference, Michelle, the lapses, oh my God. <laughs> oh my gosh, there is no time. I mean, look at right now, this is really the middle of the night for me and I'm like, oh, I just took my shower and I put my <laughs> makeup on and my little scarf and I'm acting like, yeah, I'm wide awake, you know? Sí, Michelle está en la mitad de la noche en, los, en Inglaterra con maquillándose y alistándose para estar en vivo. We actually thank you for that because it, it's really been fun uh, talking to you. both of you. I'm sorry, my tablet just fell. Are you okay? Uh, we have more questions. Um, Irvania Rodriguez uh, is asking if you guys think the quality of the productions has gone down in some way uh, because of the pandemic. Irvania Rodriguez nos pregunta que si creen que la calidad de las producciones ha disminuido en algún sentido debido a no poder grabar eh, a, eh, por causa de la pandemia. 
Do I answer? Yeah, go for it, Michelle. Yeah, I think uh, I can speak from some personal experience and also just looking at, you know, the way in which movies couldn't open in, in the US. Um, definitely, you know, making a TV episode on your iPhone, that's quality, you know, syncing really. And I guess it's really about, a get, you know, ripple effect, but the knock-on effect of that, you know, See. with more reliance on visual effects and CGI and, and less on really putting that time into prepping the production or even, you know, getting the best people in place you know, I think over the next year, it will be very interesting to see what the impact of that is, you know, and then what the audience reaction to it is as well. Sí, Michelle comenta que ha sido bastante retante, sobre todo el hecho de, por ejemplo, grabar una serie, un episodio de televisión, todo, todo el mundo desde su celular, un iPhone, no teniendo la misma calidad de imagen, es... Dentro de un año se verá de una manera interesante, pero en el momento en Estados Unidos, donde la industria es bastante abierta y continúa creciendo, como quiera sigue siendo un reto. Yeah, I, I agree with Michelle. Um, it, it's, it's a challenging time in that regard. Um, most big productions have shut down. I know some were trying to like get started and I've heard that some were forced to shut down because they weren't following the guidelines that Michelle talked about earlier. Um, and so it, it is gonna be interesting to see like what comes out you know, in the near future, like after the pandemic, um, what the quality is. Uh, I mean, I guess the one thing is like we talked about a little bit earlier is like you're kind of forced to be creative when you're in a situation like this. So there might be some amazing stuff that's coming out, who knows? Um, but it's just, yeah, we're going to have to wait and see. Um, I do know that like smaller stuff, people are doing it because if you have a, you know, two, three person crew, like documentary stuff, um, you can easily socially distance and, you know, where everybody wears masks and stands like far apart. Um, so I know people are still shooting that kind of stuff, but yeah, it's going to, I'm interested to see like what happens in a year from now when things hopefully get back to normal. Eh, bueno, Michael comenta que está de acuerdo con, con Michelle en el sentido de que ha sido, eh, ha sido bastante complejo y de que si hay producciones eh, un poco más grandes que han tenido que cerrar o que han tenido que o que han reabri, reabierto y vuelto y tenido que volver a cerrar por estándares de, de seguridad y de salud que no han estado cumpliendo, eh, pero que sí si producciones un, pequeño, un poquito más pequeñas como producciones de producciones de documentales que tienden a ser equipos más pequeños han podido trabajar porque pues, permiten el distanciamiento social que es necesario, pero que también eh, del, de la, la complejidad de la situación pues sale la creatividad y será sub, muy interesante ver cómo se desarrolla todo ya al, mientras seguimos viviendo en esta situación. Uh. We have a couple questions that um, that people are asking about creativity. So, has the lockdown increased or reduced your levels of creativity? Eh, hay un par de personas que están preguntando sobre el nivel de creatividad. O sea, si el eh, si el encierro, si los toques de queda han reducido o incrementado la creatividad al momento de trabajar. Can we go first, Michelle? Uh -huh. Uh, for me personally, I mean, I feel most creative when I'm kind of like locked in the house anyway. So yeah, so I feel like I'm a lot more creative now because I need to keep myself busy. So I'm working on the film, but then I'm also like researching other projects and developing other stuff. So for me, yes, it's like a very creative time. I don't have any distractions, obviously, like a lot of people don't have right now. Like I, there's nowhere to go. So I'm just home working all the time, um, which is good and bad. Yeah. Eh, Michael ha aprovechado este espacio para eh, poder seguir trabajando. Él dice que para él, mientras más trabajo hay, pues más grande es el flujo de creatividad. Entonces él, por suerte, ha aprovechado el hecho de que no hay más distracciones para poder trabajar eh, una película que él, él está, eh, por, que está en proceso de postproducción, pero al mismo tiempo ha aprovechado para hacer eh, investigación sobre otros proyectos. O sea que Michael está bien. <laughs> <That's good. laughs> um, yeah. 
Yeah, it's uh, it's interesting. It's created some new opportunities. For example, uh, today I got a call from uh, BBC Television here in the UK, asking me if I wanted to direct and produce a documentary about um, the impact of COVID on people of color, because people of color here in the UK and I, I think also in the US have been disproportionately impacted by COVID. So that's an opportunity that's just coming, you know, would not have existed. And because I have um, a background of working with, um, I covered uh, the Ebola crisis in Sierra Leone um, in, in kind of a slightly different capacity uh, with a charity and with the United Nations, people know that I've had experience of, of working in the field under those kind of conditions. And then on a personal level, um, I decided to start a clothing line. So uh, I just started, I was so, well, fast going crazy, I guess, but I was in uh, London when I came back from Portugal to the UK, I had to do self isolation for 14 days, but finally getting back to my country, I'm like, what am I gonna do? So I did some drawings and I got online and I set up a retail store in four days. Sí, Michelle, para Michelle ha sido un tiempo muy interesante. Eh, ella menciona que recientemente la llamó la cadena de televisión de BBC en, en Inglaterra eh, proponiéndole hacer un documental sobre las personas de color durante los tiempos de COVID. Y para ella es algo muy interesante, no solamente por lo que está ocurriendo a nivel mundial con relación a las personas de color, sino también por los antecedentes de proyectos que tiene ella trabajando, por ejemplo, en un documental sobre el ebola en África y que ya las Naciones Unidas saben los conocimientos que tiene ella. Y ya a nivel personal, ella ha comenzado una línea de ropa muy interesante que yo incluso los invito a todos que vayan a verla en su perfil de Instagram. Eh, que bueno, 14 días atrapada en un apartamento en, en Londres después de regresar a su país desde hace tres meses que estaba tratando de regresar, ahora comenzó a hacer joyería y ropa y realmente está muy interesante. Les invito a que vayan a verla en sus redes sociales. Um, we have time for two more questions, Luis. Uh, I know we have a lot on the chat, but Um, this one, I found one that is for Michael specifically. Eh, encontramos una pregunta directamente para Michael. Haremos dos preguntas más. Eh, Pauris Martínez le pregunta a Michael si está listo para eh, editar en 12K. Eh, Michael, so, eh, Pauris is asking you if you're ready to uh, edit in 12K. <laughs> in 12K? No, I'm not ready. Um, only because my computer would not be able to handle it. It would be so slow that I would go crazy and it would take probably the rest of my life. Well, not until they get better computers anyway. Uh, so no, I'm not ready. Uh, I, I usually work in like proxies and like get stuff down so that it works really, really fast. So even, I know in some productions, like people will shoot 8K, stuff like that. Like it's great if you need to punch in or something, but in terms of like, if you try to work in that actual footage, it's a nightmare. So no, I'm not ready. <laughs> Eh, creo que es bastante claro que él dijo que no, que no está listo. Eh, normalmente, Michael menciona que normalmente eh, trabaja con proxies para editar eh, videos que tienen una resolución más alta de lo que maneja su computadora, pero que hasta que las computadoras no le permitan un procesamiento más rápido, pues entonces él es una pesadilla incluso trabajar en... You said... AK. 8K, yeah, no, but the sí, question was about trabajar, 12K. Exacto, 8K, o sea que 12K es imposible. Okay, and another question that people are asking, I, I see a few. Um, how do you think that this pandemic has changed for the movie theater business? So we know the streaming wars, how they call it, it's a big thing nowadays. And coming forward, what people should be prepared for um, about them, well, about going to the movies or just accommodating to the new reality? 
o sea, eh, preguntan sobre la realidad de los cines actuales, cómo va a cambiar si las personas tendríamos ya más que nada pensar y adaptarnos a la realidad de los streamings en nuestro día a día o si podremos volver a, eh, como antes a los cines. Should I go first? <laughs> yeah, go first. Um, I, think, I think it was very interesting to see, or at least to hear about in, um, in the US, in Los Angeles, about how they were hoping to open Christopher Nolan's new movie, Tenet, as the kind of post-COVID pandemic, you know, tentpole movie. And they would keep putting up the billboards uh, and with the date and then having to take the billboard down again and change the date and put it up again and take it down again. And the most recent that I heard is now they're just advertising the movie without the date. So, sí. yeah, go ahead. Uh, sí, Michelle menciona que uno de los mejores ejemplos es como la película de Christopher Nolan, Tenet, uh, se menciona como la gran película para volver a los cines después de la pandemia del COVID y que la película sigue siendo empujada, se le sigue volviendo a poner una fecha y sigue siendo empujada y ahora solamente se está promocionando sin una fecha a prometer. You know, and I guess what it's it's interesting because it's something that, that Michael was saying is actually the way in which the industry was already really in transition, you know, in terms of cinema going and how, you know, how viable that is. You know, for example, are they going to cancel the Oscars? Oh. You know, when do they kind of take a decision that there really aren't enough movies to have the competition and give the awards out? You know, and then what's the viability for, you know, even independent cinemas in the town that I am actually in right now in Brighton, where they've had to, you know, shut down the cinemas because even with social distancing, they can't make enough revenue to have the cinemas open, even if there are films to show. So, you know, it's a remarkable moment about something that you think is always going to be there and then it can go away overnight. Sí, Michelle menciona que sigue siendo interesante, como bien lo menciona Michael, y que va a ser bien retadora, incluso en su ciudad, Bryson, donde ella se encuentra, eh, las personas tuvieron que volver a cerrar los cines porque aún las personas asistiendo al cine no era suficiente ingreso de una película de taquillera y que en sí la película de cine independiente se van a ver muy afectada por esto del COVID. Uh, uh, yeah. 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 No, I was just going to say, I mean, uh, I, yeah, I was reading about what Michelle was talking about with Nolan's film. Um, I think, I think the studios are obviously going to have to figure this out right now because it is like so new and they don't know how to release these films yet. Um, and one thing though, that is funny that I'm experiencing here in Chicago and I, it's actually all over the U S is people are returning to drive in theaters where you like take the car, you know, and like go in that's not like an answer to solve this problem because they're showing old movies that everyone's already seen. But it is funny that like people are trying to adapt and figure it out. They're going to start showing movies outside here uh, in the summertime when they can. Uh, but that, like I said, doesn't answer the question of like, what are they going to do with new films? And so I, mean, I think we'll see that in the coming months because now is the time when all the big films are supposed to be coming out. Um, well, well I, I, Perdón, Ana. No, tranquila. Eh, Michael menciona el hecho de que eh, realmente ahora mismo los estudios van a tener que resolver, por decirlo de una forma muy simple, eh, porque sobre todo en esta temporada, que es donde se supone que se lanzan las, las, películas, las películas más grandes, más taquilleras del año, eh, pero que sí un fenómeno que ha sido interesante es que la gente ha vuelto a los cines eh, a cielo abierto, en los tarros, como se hacían antes. Eh, aquí en el país no creo que hayamos tenido, es, vivido esa experiencia, pero, pero sí era muy común antes en Estados Unidos. Y realmente, aunque no lo han hecho para películas nuevas, eh, sería interesante ver cómo se adapta la situación completa y esa posible experiencia al estreno de películas más, más nuevas. Uh, well, guys, it's not fair the fact that we are out of time, but uh, before we go, I need you two to tell something to our young audience. Any tips, any advice you have for them? Eh, se nos está acabando el tiempo, pero antes de irnos, quiero que 
Michelle y Michael le den algún consejo o un tip a nuestra joven audiencia. So, uh, two really good pieces of advice that I was given is one, give yourself permission, green light yourself, don't wait for other people to give you permission to do what you want to do. And the second one is do what you have to do to get noticed. Sí, Michelle comenta que primero tú date permiso a ti mismo, no esperes que otros te den permiso a ti. Y la segunda es haz lo que tengas que hacer, sobre todo en estos tiempos. I guess my, my advice would be, yeah, um, just don't, I guess it kind of goes to like what I was saying about how when I'm home and now and I'm, I'm trapped here, like I'm just working all the time. Like don't let yourself stop working, you know, like keep working towards what your goal is. Um, keep creating, keep practicing, like, you know, the making films, I feel like it's the more you do it, the better you get. So just keep doing it, even if you're stuck at home. Eh, Michael dice que el mejor consejo que puede darnos es seguir trabajando, seguir aprendiendo, seguir creando y no, no, o sea, no dejarse detener por nada. Ok. Eh, gracias Inés y Ana por las traducciones. Thank, Thank you, you, Michael. Thank you. Thank you. It's been such a pleasure getting to know you and I hope we can meet face to face soon. Eh, gracias a todos por estar con nosotros en el día de hoy. Muchísimas gracias a Michelle y a Michael. And thank you to the translators. Thank you. <laughs> yes. Amazing job. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, guys. Bye.